everybody. I think we'll get going. I see folks joining, and for the sake of time, um, go ahead and introduce our speaker. Um, so I am very thankful uh, to Dr. Skanga for joining us uh, today. Uh, a little bit of background on him. He went to UNC Chapel Hill uh, for undergrad um, and then went to UNC for med school there as well. Uh, he then did his internship and residency in uh, internal medicine at Vanderbilt uh, and went out to University of Washington for his uh, fellowship in gastroenterology and uh, transplant hepatology. And he's now been at Vanderbilt almost 15 years, I guess, since 2009. Um, and uh, he is one of our transplant hepatologists and uh, someone who's been a huge resource to me as I've had questions over the years. And, um, as I work in our pre-op optimization clinic, I'll often reach out when I have um, a patient with some some liver disease and have a question. Um, he has been a recipient of tons of awards and honors um, over the years. He's very involved um, with um, the liver and kidney transplant clinic operations at Vanderbilt. In fact, he's a medical director of that. Um, he has been in charge of um, CME conferences involving um, uh, liver pathology and uh, transplant. He's involved with transplant quality. Um, and so he is a true expert in this area. And um, I was delighted when he accepted the invitation to come and speak today and really talk about something that we, I don't know if we're seeing it more because it's happening more or if we're seeing it just because we're beginning to look a little bit closer, but um, really to think about that patient who has some underlying liver disease or flat out cirrhosis and how to think about them and their risk uh, in the preoperative period. Um, what can we do to maybe better evaluate or optimize them before surgery? And also maybe just some of the better understanding of the risk. So even if there isn't a whole lot to do per se, um, preoperatively, A, from an anesthesia perspective, what are some of the things we need to be thinking about in the OR and, and then in the postoperative period? And B, um, really to think about how do you counsel that patient and consider some of the risks. So, um, so much, uh, so thankful for Dr. Skanga joining us. Um, I'm going to, whoops, man, I'm sorry, y'all. I don't have my extended desktop today and I'm struggling. There's the CME code. Um, 76245. Remember to text it to that number. We'll put that in the chat. If you've never registered before, you can use that QR code and it'll take you. Um, and uh, and you can register VMC Sorry. CME to keep a record for you. Matt, you're, you're um, also, your screen, right? um, and 76245. And uh, you can use uh, that code again. We'll put it in the chat. And then uh, in Two weeks, please join us when Dr. Bobby Jean Schweitzer, who has been in this series before, uh, will be talking about preoperative assessment and management of thyroid. Uh, and she's really going to focus on thyroid and parathyroid. Uh, we were emailing recently, and she said to get through adrenal is just uh, too much um, in all in one. And just a reminder, we are having uh, the American Society for Enhanced Recovery and Perioperative Medicine meeting uh, here in Nashville, and there's a QR code if you are interested there. So that's September th uh, 11th through 13th this year. So thanks again for joining us, Andy. No problem. My pleasure. Let me first share the screen because I have to. And thanks for the warm introduction. And so pretty much what I'm mostly going to focus on, the preoperative risk assessment in patients with cirrhosis and sort of preoperative assessment in general um, for patients. Obviously, intraoperative management and uh, some postoperative management is going to probably be too too large for this uh, this this talk. And so I, I figured I would focus on this. And for some reason, my slides are not advancing. One second. There we go. So for disclosures, um, I have no relevant commercial relationships to disclose uh, related to this talk. And so kind of my objectives are to identify for everybody who's partaking is to learn how to identify patients with liver disease who may be at risk of have, for having cirrhosis and adverse outcomes following surgery. And then understand also the difference between compensated and decompensated disease and the pathophysiology that increases surgical risk. And then gain a familiarity with the different risk prediction models of patients with cirrhosis undergoing non-hepatic surgery. And then to kind of the and go into more detail on sort of like pre preoperative counseling and um, and uh, the decision whether or not to proceed. 
I'm going to start off with the clinical scenario, and this is actually pretty common. This comes up in our practice quite a bit. So I have a 58-year-old male with diabetes, mild obesity, nasterosis, complicated by di uh, diuretic control ascites and no history of encephalopathy or variceal bleeding, who's desiring to pursue a right knee replacement due to limited mobility, impacting quality of life and ability to exercise. And as you see here, his labs are as follows. Sodium is 133, so slightly hyponatremia. Creatinine is 1.0. Bilirubin is 1.4. Albumin is 3.4. And INR is 1.3, so a little bit of synthetic dysfunction. His CKP score, though, is 7, which is a child's B, so just barely over. And his MELD score is 11, should you proceed. And so we're going to return to this case at the end um, of, of the talk, and we'll kind of discuss a little bit about where, where you might go or what might be the answer. And so brief outline, I'm going to give a background of the problem and uh, the scope of the problem, a little bit of the scope of the problem. I'm going to go over the pathophysiology of portal hypertension, not too extensively, but some so we can understand why these patients can get into trouble in the operating room. And then and then also postoperatively in terms of why things uh, may not go well. And then preoperative assessment, I'm going to discuss non-invasive assessment of fibrosis because, um, because uh, as you're noting, we're seeing a lot of patients with liver disease now. I'm going to talk about biomarkers and then also elastography. And then I'm going to spend a good portion of the time talking about postoperative post mortality risk assessment. Matt, you're right. There is an increasing prevalence of cirrhosis and fatty liver, and also and um, and cirrhosis due to rise of fatty liver disease and alcohol-related liver disease. And as a result, there's also been an increased number of surgeries performed in cirrhotics. And this is the off the National Insurance Database. And if you look at the blue shaded area. In 2005, there were about 20,000 um, hospitalizations uh, uh, for uh, surgeries performed in cirrhotics. And then in 2014, it was up to 25,000. So there was a 25% increase over a, over a period of a decade. And why is this um, important is because as you, as many are aware in this, uh, in uh, ten, listening to this, is that patients with cirrhosis are at higher risk of mortality following surgery. And especially if you look at non-elective versus elective. And so in this graph here, the same database, you look at elective, um, non-elective abdominal, major abdominal surgery, you're looking at a mortality around 25%. And that was fairly consistent over time. Um, the and then you can see the other major cardiovascular still has a high mortality. And the other surgeries, such as cholecystectomy, hernia repair, and major abdominal uh, surgeries, um, had still have a higher mortality compared to the elective side, but still, um, but still mortality is high for both sides. But as you can tell, non-elective is definitely ups the odds quite a bit. And so these patients don't do well in under urgent emergency situations. And just so you know, just to kind of go back, I forgot to mention that this rise in surgeries, the procedures being form, performed is largely in the orthopedic, major orthopedic uh, surgeries followed by her, abdominal wall hernia repairs. What is cirrhosis? And so cirrhosis is the development of regenerative nodules surrounded by fibrous bands in response to chronic liver injury. And so anything that causes chronic inflammation of the liver can cause cirrhosis. So um, not just alcohol, not just the um, fatty liver disease or hep C. And as that injury progresses, continues over time, the fibro fibrosis starts to progress. And then eventually uh, leading to cirrhosis. And then eventually what, as uh, the liver can actually even appear normal early on with cirrhosis on like CT scan and ultrasound, but eventually it does get that lumpy, bumpy appearance that we're all familiar with and changes of left lobe uh, where the left lobe becomes enlarged and the cardiac lobe becomes enlarged. Then as things continue to progress, the circuit, the blood flow through the liver actually starts to become impeded. And so the portal blood flow, so portal pressures will start to increase. And as you know, all the blood from the intestines and spleen flows through the liver first before it goes back to the heart. One of the earliest changes that you occur is you get splenomegaly, and so um, ordinarily it takes out dead blood cells, but as it gets big and congested, it starts to hold on to some of the good ones, so the platelet counts can be low. And then bypass routes called varices will develop um, in, the, um, in the esophagus and stomach is where they can develop on the inside lining there and where they can bleed. They can develop elsewhere on the, um, in the intestinal tract, but are less likely to bleed in those other locations. And then you can also get shunts where to bypass blood elsewhere from like the uh, splenic vein over to the um, renal vein. As pressures continue to build, then eventually you can get complications of the studies where fluid starts to weep off the liver and into the belly. And then also encephalopathy from synthetic dysfunction where the liver is no longer able to um, 
process ammonia rapidly enough and convert it to urea so ammonia can build up causing neurotoxicity. And so when you develop one of those complications, either a variceal bleeding, hepatic encephalopathy, ascites, or hepatic hydrothorax, that's when your liver, well, that's when liver cirrhosis goes from compensated to decompensated. And this is very important because once you develop decompensated disease, the mortality, the one-year mortality sharply increases to greater than 20%. Whereas it was quite was whereas much lower when you still had compensated disease. And this also has an importance with regards to perioperative and postoperative mortality risk, is that if you're if you have compensated disease, you're much less likely to have uh, um, to die following a cert, uh, uh, operative procedure than compared to decompensated disease. And as you can see here from that same group, um, those undergoing major uh, abdominal surgery had a 20 to 25 percent um, risk of mortality. And as you can see, same with uh, cardiovascular and cardiovascular is quite high as well. And when you see decompensation postoperatively, it generally does not occur immediately. Patients are not don't come out of the OR immediately jaundiced or with uh, or with ascites or anything like that. Generally, it starts to manifest itself or becomes clinically evident five to 14 days after the procedure. And um, we frequently will see this in patients who had compensated disease and underwent cholecystectomy. They get discharged, but then about a week or so later, they're showing up with ascites and um, doing poorly. And so that's um, so it's not immediately or immediately evident that somebody is um, not going to tolerate a surgery. So why does this occur? Portal hypertension is results in some significant circulatory dysfunction. And the way this develops, and as you, as I go through this, you can kind of see how anesthesia, these can possibly increase the risks of anesthesia and other complications that might occur um, during a procedure. So with increased hepatic re, intrahepatic resistance, um, as the as the fibrosis progresses, you will get release of nitric oxide, prostaglandin, and endocanna, endocannabinoids which then in turn increases, uh, causes splanchnic phase of dilation and increasing portal blood flow, exacerbating and augmenting the portal hypertension um, and further propagating this sort of feedback loop that um, continues to slowly make the problem worse. Then these same mediators also cause peripheral vasodilation and, peripheral, and a drop in peripheral vascular resistance. And then essentially, we're low systemic vascular resistance. And essentially, you have a deep drop in the effective arterial blood volume. So you can imagine that if you have an agent that drops uh, uh, blood pressure or if there's significant blood loss, this can have an even, aug even more augmented effect on other organs in terms of perfusion. As a compensatory mechanism, early on, you get an increase in cardiac output. And then you also get an increase in the renin angi uh, angi activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and the sympathetic nerves, nervous system. Um, and what happens is then you start getting sodium retention and renal vasoconstriction. Initially, you don't get kidney injury because of some compensatory mechanisms via prostaglandin release and vasodilation of the re afferent renal arterioles. But eventually, this will be overcome. And then you'll get a drop in the urine output and um, overcome, and then you can get a paterenal syndrome. But as you're getting the sodium retention, even before you get renal dysfunction, you will have some drop in urine output, but you also will increase volume retention. And of course, tissues become edematous, which can complicate per, uh, um, surgeries, but then all, in addition to significant volume overload, which can also be a complicating factor. So just so you know, though, as time goes on, eventually the, it, with this increased cardiac output, the, eventually you can develop what we call cirrhotic cardiomyopathy, and the cardiac output will start to start to decrease, which can also be a, a heralding uh, 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 fact uh, factor for precipitating renal failure and further uh, um, and further decompensation and um, poor outcomes. And it's not just limited to these uh, hemodynamic changes. There are also other uh, um, there are systemic inflammation increases in setting cirrhosis via release of inflammatory mediators, such as uh, IL-6. Bacterial uh, products translocate from the gut, um, in particular liposolid polysaccharides, because the gut does become leaky when it becomes edematous. And then the injured hepatocytes themselves secrete various different factors that wind up contributing to systemic vasodilation. Also, um, what is also not, un which is 
can occur in the setting of cirrhosis is that our patients can develop a relative adrenal insufficiency, about 24 to 47%, which contributes to decreased atrial arterial pressure and uh, increased renin, all compounding these effects that can, uh, that, um, can exacerbate negative um, components of um, aspects of the surgery, such as hypotension from uh, sedate, from uh, uh, medications or anesthesia or from blood loss or, or, or any other number of events. So in addition to the circulatory derangements, what other factors that in serotonin can actually increase operative risk? Well, there's a splanchnic venous congestion that can make sewing things difficult. There's also increased risk of infection in general in patients with cirrhosis that can portend for poor postoperative outcome. There's a predilection for hematostatic dysfunction, either bleeding or thrombosis. Remember, the elevated INR in the setting of cirrhosis does not necessarily is not the same as an elevated INR in the setting of uh, warfarin use. And these patients might have an INR of three, but they may be prone to clot off everything, which is why uh, um, you know our anesthesiology colleagues, you guys often use the thromboelastogram to really give us give yourselves an indication of what is going um, from a hemostatic standpoint um, with a patient during the during during uh, an operation. And there's also impaired clearance of numerous drugs, so they can hang out a long time. And then a lot of, because of uh, cirrhosis and uh, especially in decompensated liver disease. And then there's also frailty. And many of our patients have sig uh, significant protein calorie malnutrition and muscle wasting. So in the preoperative assessment, first you wanna identify whether or not liver disease is present. Sometimes it's readily obvious somebody has cirrhosis, but sometimes it may or may not be that, or may not may not be obvious that they even have liver disease. So of course you're going to do a history and physical, and then you're also you always want to screen for risk factors for acquired liver disease, and um, and so you want to so such as obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, IV, intranasal drug use, alcohol use, abuse. You want to look at a uh, transfusion history, especially before 1991, because that's when the blood supply was started to get screened for hepatitis C. Unprofessional tattoos is a risk factor and history of incarceration. If there's those items in the history, you might think, oh, these guys, this person might be at risk for a liver disease. If there's a family history of liver disease that can also put it on the on the radar. Then you're going to do an exam. Some of these things may automatically, obviously, uh, automatically tell you that this patient may have advanced liver disease, cirrhosis, or decompensated disease, such as jaundice or organomegaly um, or ascites if present. But if it's just edema um, or pulmonary edema or spider or spider angiomas, as de as uh, depicted here. Those can be signs of advanced liver disease, but not necessarily make the diagnosis. And sometimes they can sometimes be subtle. And so, if you see these, it will you should it should raise the um, question of whether or not somebody might have advanced liver disease and any of these things. And just so you know, spider telangiectasias generally occur in high estrogen states. So you can also see it during pregnancy and uh, on sometimes on hormonal therapy. But uh, generally, it's cirrhosis or pregnancy are your most common so times you will see these spider telangiectasias where there's a central arterial that blanches and fills peripherally, these capillaries peripherally from um, some from center of the peripheral, peripherally when you press on them. And then of course, you're gonna do a lab evaluation. You're gonna get a CMP, CMB, CBC. Coags are not necessarily always routinely checked, but if you're concerned about liver disease or advanced liver disease, then you're gonna to wanna to check coags. And just so you know, though, I mean, a lot of patients have elevated transaminase values as high as 9.8% of the general population. And in one study, 13% of medical evaluations, uh, uh, there was there were elevated transaminase values. So if it's they don't have obvious cirrhosis, you're, it's going to be hard to wade through all of them and if efficiently get through and um, work up people for surgery, for, uh, for an operation and actually uh, accomplish them. So the next thing you kind of, what, so what you can do, uh, so then what, if you see elevated liver enzymes and there's concern for chronic liver disease, what you can do is screen for advanced fibrosis. The gold standard for assessing for fibrosis is biopsy, but this is not practical or wide or able to be widely implemented. So there's been a lot of effort to um, to um, looking investigating in, uh, non-invasive markers uh, for advanced fibrosis. And I'm going to discuss biomarkers, which are primarily lab tests or lab panels, and elastography. Just so you know, so in order to talk about these the items, you have to understand how fibrosis is staged. And fibrosis is staged from zero, which is no fibrosis, to four, which is cirrhosis. And what happens is as a, there's chronic liver injury and um, it progresses, um, this is a case of fatty liver disease right here, or NASH, 
what happens is that the portal tracts generally in early on don't have any increased collagen and collagen stain blue on this trichrome stain. Then as time progresses, the portal tracts start to expand. You start to see more blue extending out from them with the, the, in the portal tracts. With stage two, they, the collagen starts to extend out from the portal tract. Stage three is when there's bridging between one portal tract and another. And stage four is when they're all when you have <clears throat> all the portal tracts surrounding a lobule start um, become connected with fibrosis. And sometimes you'll even have uh, bridging from the portal tract to the central vein, which is in the middle of the lobule. When that develops, that's what cirrhosis is. And so that's stage four. And like I said, and early on, on an ultrasound or CT scan, a liver can appear, can be cirrhotic, but still appear normal. Like I said, there are several uh, efforts to try to identify um, uh, how to screen for these patients. There's been a lot of efforts been made and several panels have been proposed. And this is just a sampling of them. One of the most common ones, used that, ones that we use is the FIB4. Um, index because it's kind of widely applicable to any disease state. The NAPL fibrosis score is more focused for fatty liver disease. Granted, though, we have a lot of fatty liver disease in this uh, in our population, so it's a useful one to know. There's also the BAT, and these three up here, and there's also the APRI, there's other ind indices, all use common clinical labs and variables that we can obtain, that we that are readily available and, and uh, um, can be found um, found in the chart or just with simple labs. There are also commercially available panel, commercially available panels such as the uh, enhanced liver fibrosis panel or the fiber test or fiber sure panels. And they you look at markers of, of hepatic fibrosis that are not necessarily um, routinely tested. And just so you know, they all perform about the same. And so you know, in general, we just use the ones that are free, which you can get from just a routine clinical data that we all have access to. And I'm going to show you how well they perform and how we actually use them. This is um, so this is this. Um, so these panels, generally what you do is you plug in all those variables and it spits out a score low below a certain cutoff, indicating a low probability for having significant fibrosis and it, or it can be high above a certain other above another a different cutoff a higher cutoff indicating a high probability for having advanced fibrosis if you get a score in the middle between these two so for instance for fib4 it's 1.45 is the low cutoff and 3.25 is the high cutoff if you get a score in between it's indeterminate and you can't really make a decision what is most useful is the negative predictive values of these scores so if the score is low less than like 1.45, there's a 92.7% chance that this patient does not have significant fibrosis. And the lower score, um, if you go down to 0 0.9, it's near, it's, you start to near 90, you're around 95, 98% chance that there's no significant fibrosis. And what's also good is that the negative predictive value, even at the high range is pretty good. So if the score is less than 3.25, there's still, even if it's in that indeterminate, there's pretty high chance that this person does not have advanced fibrosis. But generally, we use the lower score. We in you, lower score, and this these scoring systems are most useful in ruling out advanced fibrosis. If it's high, as you can see here, the positive predictive values are not quite as good. Um, the higher the score, the more likely, but still. So if it's high, you may still want to do some additional assessment to determine if there is actually significant fibrosis present. But if it's low, if it, the score is below here, you may you should feel pretty good that and if the patient has no other obvious signs of having advanced fibrosis or any or cirrhosis or anything like that, odds are they probably don't. And you can probably proceed. Now, if you get an indeterminate score or a higher score, then you might want to do something more to try to sort out whether or not there is advanced fibrosis present. And this is where elastography comes in. And elastography measures the stiffness of the liver. All right, the more fibrosis in the liver, the harder it becomes, and the more rapid energy is transmitted through it. And there's three modalities of elastography, and we have all of them here at Vanderbilt. The first is ultrasound or acoustic radiation force impulse. And what it is, is like your, it's, our, it's your standard ultrasound, standard ultrasound probe, but what they do is they, um, with additional software, they'll put the probe in one location, generally in the mid-axillary line, and then measure how fast the sound wave impulses travel through the liver. And by looking at the speed, you can get a gauge of the stiffness. The faster it travels, the stiffer it is. 
and it works pretty well. I'll go through some data here in a second. However, there's a relatively high rate of unreliable scans. The next modality is very vibration control and elastic, transient elastography. It too uses ultrasound, but the impulse is not a, is a mechanical impulse. And this, uh, this is a picture of the probes. And here it's an ultrasound probe, but there's this piston right here in the middle that vibrates and sends little vibrations to the liver. It's placed again in the same location in the mid-axillary line in the intercostal space. And you measure how fast the, the little piston goes and you measure how fast the vibrations travel through the liver and that can correlate with stiffness. The unreliable scan rate is low. The scan failure rate in patients with fatty liver disease is a little bit higher at three to 14%. And both of these are not very good if the BMI is over 35. And it can, this test can also give you a rough quantification of steatosis, but it's really not good, uh, good at that. So then the last form of, uh, of elastography is magnetic resonance elastography. It too is mechanical, and so it uses MRI, and a pad is affixed to the patient's, over the patient's abdomen, over the liver, and it uh, and there's a then it's connected to a tube that oscillates air in and out to cause to create the vibration. So it too is a mechanical, uh, causes a mechanical energy impulse. It perhaps performs the best out of all of them. It, what's nice is that it can be used at higher BMIs with pretty high accuracy. It can also quantify fat and also quantify iron as well. Um, the fail rate is low, but the things though there's cost and claustrophobia and inability to hold for uh, breath holding and whatnot that can complicate it. So how do these perform? So as you can see here, the uh, fiber scan has an area under the receiver operator curve of 0 0.88, which is pretty darn good as uh, closer to one is better, right? And the MR, MRE is 0 0.96, and ultrasound has been reported to be similar to MRE, and this is for NAFLD, which is perhaps the disease state where elastography struggles the most. Um, and they actually perform pretty well. Now, ultrasound show, reports, a very, uh, reports a pretty high performance, but just keep in mind that this data comes off of only three studies, pretty much all sponsored by the, um, by the makers. So you do have to take that with a grain of salt. In our experience, it probably performs similar to the fiber scan. If you do this assessment and there's no concern for advanced fibrosis, then you can likely proceed with your procedure. However, though, if there is concern for advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis, then you're going to want to refer them to us for evaluation. But then you're also going to want to get a sense of the postoperative mortality risk if you have the time to refer them to us. Postoperative mortality risk should you should you proceed? And there are several. And there's over time, there's been a lot of effort over the decades to try to figure out, try to predict who will do poorly with um, following a procedure who has cirrhosis. And I'm going to discuss the four models that are primarily used. Other things, other scoring systems have been used, including FIB4 and whatnot, but they're not widely applied. So I'm not going to really spend much time on them. But I'm going to discuss the child turco pew score, CTP, the MELD score, the Mayo risk score, and the vocal pen um, score or calculator. As you can see here, they all have varying different clinical parameters that are used to that are that are used to determine try to determine operative risk. What's interesting is that they all share three common variables, though, which are perhaps the most highly predictive, which is the bilirubin, creatinine, and INR. I'm going to start off with the CTP since it was uh, um, this, which is which was the first uh, model to be developed. And that, in addition to those three variables, also includes ascites, encephalopathy, and albumin. But it does not, um, excuse me, ascites, uh, excuse me, the albumin. It gives you, uh, um, and you, you plug these in, and you get, and you you plug those you use and you plug these variables into sort of this table, and based on the severity of the derangement for each of them, will you you will get points, and in the end you'll get a score that goes from five to fifteen, and with um, and three of them as you three of these variables are purely objective, and two of these are subjective, which is perhaps one of the pitfalls of this because ascites can be you know is it mild is it moderate you know, that that can be that can be a little bit of a gray zone. And a pad, same with hepatic encephalopathy, grade two, grade, you know, as well, or none, grade one, mild, subclinical. So there's a, it, it's a little bit fraught with um, sort of whoever's using it, um, operator error. But just so you know, this was developed in 1964 originally to predict who would do poorly with transection of the transection of the esophagus for variceal bleeding. So back in the day, before endoscopy, they would go in and transect the esophagus at the GE junction, which also transected all of those varices, and then reanastomose it. As you can imagine, 
that was a fair, quite morbid and mortal procedure that when, when it was done. So it was developed in 1964 and eventually formalized in 1973, and it was mostly applied to intra-abdominal surgeries at first. The score, the, the score performs differently depending on the type of surgery, and so in which is important because you can't necessarily apply the experience from one surgery to an, uh, another. And so if you have a, um, so if you get a child's class A score, which is five or six points, then the 30-day mortality for a, a abdominal surgery is 10%. However, for emergent TKA, it's 4.7%. A cardiac surgery with cardiopulmonary bypass, interestingly, is only 3%. But if you look at child's class C, you know, for the abdominal, uh, you know, for, excuse me, B, excuse me, it, the risks do go up, but it's at varying different, but it's different for each procedure. And then child's class C, as you can tell, it come, becomes nearly fatal um, when you start to, um, if you decide to proceed with one of these uh, procedures, major sur types of surgery. Um, so, you know, the problem with the CTP score is that there's a, there are several subjective parameters, and it's not generalizable across all types of surgery. And so with, with, with whatever surgery you are considering, you have to go back, if you're going to use the CTP score to estimate risk, you have to go back and look at the literature and see what, um, what the general experience was, which are all small case series that were published, that have been published randomly over time, and then try to apply that to your patient. And then the CTP does not factor in underlying disease, which does of um, you know in terms of what causes cirrhosis, which does have a bit of an uh, have an impact, and in general often has led to overestimation of risk. And so the next step, so there's still there was always there was a desire to come up with something that's a little less subjective and maybe a little, and performs a little bit better. And so the MELD score is the next thing we were going to discuss. And again, it includes the bilirubin, and creatinine, and IR, INR, but now it actually includes uh, dial um, so, uh, the sodium score. The original did not. It also includes dialysis, but dialysis is essentially a reflection of the creatinine. If somebody's on dialysis, they their creat the creatinine score is maximizes at four. So if somebody's on dialysis, they just get a four in the in the equation. And so, and this is the equation right here, where each of these variables have a weight. And as you can see here, the bilirubin has a weight of three point seven eight, which is the lowest, and the INR has the highest weighting of eleven point two followed by the creatinine of 9.57. So that's how much these values are multiplied. And um, then that's, you plug the vari variables in and that spits out a score. It goes from six to 40. And what it does is it predicts your, it, it in six to 40. And this was originally designed just so in, in 2001 to predict who would do poorly following TIPS placement. And then it was quickly realized that it would actually, actually had a pretty good uh, pred prediction of survival on the wait list. And what it's primarily used now is to predict short-term uh, survival or 90-day uh, survival in patients with cirrhosis. And the lower the MELT score, the higher the, the higher the survival. And if it's under 15, your 90-day survival is less is greater than 95%. But then as the MELT score starts to go up, it gets to um, it starts to go down. And generally, patients don't get a survival benefit from transplant until that score is over 15. And it's also how we now rank patients on the transplant wait list um, should they be after an evaluation and if they're approved to be placed on the list. And the higher the MELT score, the higher the on the wait list they go. And wait time really doesn't mean much anymore. This has also been studied to see if it will predict uh, postoperative mortality. And the one of the most con you know sort of seminal studies with this is uh, published out of the Mayo that looked at the di um, looked at their experience for patients undergoing major digestive, orthopedic, or cardiac surgeries, and they compared it to outpatient control group of cirrhotic patients not undergoing uh, any sort of operations, and they also compared it to another, and there was a second control group comparing to minor, uh, minor uh, patients with cirrhosis who underwent minor surgery, including general anesthesia, and they, and these were primarily <clears throat> appendectomies and hernia raphies were termed minor, along with other minor procedures, which they didn't really go into a lot of detail, and so these were, those were the two comparison groups, and as you see here, um, to illustrate that Patients undergoing major surgery who had cirrhosis had a poor survival that compared to cirrhotics not undergoing surgery or cirrhotics who underwent minor surgery. And they found when looking at the MELD score that the relative risk compared to these control groups 
started uh, mortality with a surgery started to go up at a MELD score of eight, as you can see here where these two lines intersect. That's where it goes up. And then the higher the MELD score, the higher the relative risk of mortality. And on a logarithmic scale, you can kind of see here at this table here sort of illustrates that mortality. The MELD score is low. They say zero to seven. I mean, there's it stops by six is set. Six is the lowest. Um, if it's six to seven, the 30 day mortality is pretty low with these major surgeries. But as you go up, the, once you get over a MELD score of 25, you have a 90 day, um, 30 day mortality. And as the years go on, as you uh, they and it predicts mortality for 90, 30, 90 um, day, um, 30, 30 days, 90 days, one year, five years, and so forth. And in their additional analysis, they found that the MELD score was the strongest predictor of mortality. The, the age, ASA class, um, and serum creatinine all were independent predictors. And the CTP score, along with its individual components, were uh, uh, independent predictors of mortality on univariate analysis. However, when, you, when they plugged it into multivariate analysis, only the MELD score, age, and ASA class seemed to really predict mortality, which then led to the development of the Mayo risk score where again you see it's pretty much the components of the original MELD score, MELD score with bilirubin and creatinine and INR, and then they added on ASA and AH. In addition, they also threw in the etiology of cirrhosis, and in that paper <clears throat> that I just discussed, they published a link to this calculator that you can, um, which is a website um, where you can plug in those variables to get, um, and it will um, give you mortality risk. Again, you get age, you use ASA score. Generally, all patients with compensated cirrhosis were considered an ASA score of three, and uh, if you had decompensated, you were considered a four. Then the bilirubin, creatinine, INR. And the etiologies were um, pretty much categorized as either alcoholic or cholestatic liver disease or viral or other. So fatty liver disease would land here, alcohol would land up here, even though histologically they look very similar. And so then you hit compute and then you get your scores. The thing is though, they this was put out there and there really was no validation in that study of how well this model, including the, the etiology of cirrhosis actually performed. Um, but it was pretty widely started to get, it was widely used fairly early on um, when this was published um, in 2000, around 2009. So a couple studies were done afterwards elsewhere to kind of see how, um, how it actually performed and um, in uh, different populations, and in this, there was really not a lot out there looking at for ma for what they study, which is major abdominal, orthopedic, or um, um, cardiovascular surgeries. And as you as you can see, the predicted value the it performed fairly well. The area under the CR operator curve was zero point seven seven um, for thirty days, and still pretty reasonable for ninety days. However, at one year. Predicting one year mortality was not as good, and that's not that's to be expected. You know, so it did seem to perform well. And this study was actually done in 2011, so it was holding up at that time. But what is interesting, and which is a good lesson to learn for all these models, is that accuracy tends to the accuracy of the models tend to wane over time. In this one study, looking at applying that model to the VA database of patients who underwent uh, um, various abdominal surgeries, looking at the predicted uh, mortality based on the model compared to what was observed, you can see in 2008 to 2010, the 30 day mortality, and this line is supposed to be as close to this curve as possible. 30 day mortality performed pretty well. In the 90 day mortality, it performed pretty well early on. And this line again should be as close to this dotted line so that the predicted uh, matches the observed. But then as each time period progresses, where 2017 and 19, by 2017 and 19, the, it was way overestimating mortality in patients undergoing, sur undergoing uh, surgery. And that was in part pro um, probably because it does not take into account that things evolve, surgical techniques evolve, anesthetic uh, um, practices evolve. And so the model might have, what might have worked a decade or three decades ago is not necessarily applicable, may not necessarily be quite app as applicable to our patient population today. So the authors who were investigating that actually set out to see if they can develop a newer score that may, might be more accurate. And so this is the vocal pen score. And in addition to the three common variables, they also it also includes albumin, the ASA score, age, but they also included whether or not the procedure was an emergency procedure. They included surgery type, 
platelets, whether or not fatty liver disease is present in BMI. This data, they developed this model out of the veteran outcomes and costs associated with liver disease database. And Penn stands for University of Pennsylvania because the authors were primarily all out of Pennsylvania. And what they did is they set out to not only predict mortality, but they also set out to see if that model can de um, predict decompensation um, following a uh, following a major sur following surgery in general. It was a VA cohort, as I said, of 4,712 sur individual surgeries, and it was largely male, as expected, given the VA population, 97 percent, mostly white, and uh, and mostly white. And they included not only those standard uh, major surgeries, but they also included um, more minor surgeries, such as abdominal wall and vascular surgeries. And here's, as you can see, the breakdown of surgeries, the primary, the, the, the largest number of, um, largest type was abdominal wall surgeries, followed by major orthopedic, and um, the least common was chest and cardiac surgeries. Baseline population was mostly CTPA uh, a class A patients, as expected, um, given this was a retrospective analysis, and generally most of the child's class Bs and Cs patients are not were not opted to undergo undergo any sort of undergo procedures. They also looked at um, the ASA class was primarily three as well. The, this patient population was primarily ASA class three, and the vast majority had alcohol liver disease as a, if not as the primary, if not a, as a component of their underlying liver, of their um, underlying um, as the cause for their cirrhosis. When they did an analysis, they found those nine variables that I discussed, and just so you know, the ASA um, class was perhaps one of the biggest uh, uh, prognosticators where the higher the ASA class, the, the lower the survival, where the six month survival for an a for ASA four patients was 80 was um, only 80 percent compared. And then if you look at the different types of surgery, abdominal lapar laparoscopic abdominal surgeries tended to do best and the lap abdominal open surgeries tended to do worse. And as you can see, abdominal wall um, also did fairly well as well. And the others were, like I said, vascular major orthopedic. When you looked at fat, presence of fatty liver disease, um, the, compared to other diseases, fatty liver disease was a negative predictor for survival. And when they, and you can say, well, maybe that's because of cardiovascular risk, uh, um, cardiovascular risk because they have fatty liver disease and metabolic syndrome. But when they looked at other cardiovascular risk factors, they did not tend to outperform NAFLD. And when they added them to the model or replaced it with NAFLD, they, um, the model behaved, uh, performed very similarly. So they opted just to uh, perform similarly. And there was not really much improvement of the model, including them. So they just decided to use NAFLD. And then what was interesting was obesity was somewhat protective. And so if your BMI was over 30, the survival actually was somewhat better. And so they plugged this in and they've had a derivation cohort. And as you can see, the vocal pen outperformed the Mayo model, the MELD score, and the CTP score um, in terms of predicting mortality with an area under the receiver operator curve of 0 0.87. They had a validation cohort as well, and it still performed very similarly and with similar results. That's for 30-day mortality, 90-day mortality, similar results, um, where the vocal pen had a pretty good um, performance with an um, area under the curve of 0 0.81, 0, excuse me, 0 0.841. The question is, well, that was the VA population. Is this applicable to the populations outside of the VA? So they did another study looking at a patient population from Beth Israel and also for the University of Pennsylvania. And this is important because, like I said, the VA study was mostly, it was 90 plus percent males. Here, these, the, these, uh, both of these populations were only 64% male. And there was a higher African-American uh, percentage of African-Americans in the University of Pennsylvania population. And when they applied this, uh, um, apply, when they applied the vocal pen um, uh, tool to this population, it performed similarly well as 0.84 and 30-day and 90-day mortality, 0.84 and 0.82. Interestingly, the MELD score and the Mayo score, at least in this, performed similarly well. They did not include the CTP because it just did not perform well. But then when they actually looked at the calibration curves, where in terms of what was predicted compared to what was actually observed, this, the Mayo risk score tended to perform, more, um, tended to overestimate risk um, with a higher uh, risk estimates of mortality compared to what was actually observed. And so 
and as you can see, the vocal pen actually is pretty close straight on this, uh, uh, um, the ideal line. And so, and also you could say similar for meld score, but when they looked at meld score greater than 15, its performance actually started to drop. So if the if the meld score was low, it actually had a pretty good um, correlation with mortality, but if it was over 15, the, the correlation started to wane. What about decompensation? Like I said, that's important because that does add on length of stay, hospitalization, and other um, um, morbidity for the patient. So knowing what the risk of decompensation is, is, is uh, fairly important. And it performed pretty well for that. Um, again, here they looked at 408 patients, obviously patients who died were um, not necessarily always, uh, um, they uh, somewhat, uh, obviously they were assumed to decompensate. They looked at 408 patients and here you can see 48% um, of 8.7% of pay, those patients that decompensated following their, um, their operation. And the most common uh, decompensating event was ascites. And so at 90 days, you can see the um, derivation and validation performance curves. And as you can see, it, it performed the vocal pen score performed pretty well, quite well with areas under the curve of 7.66. Not quite as good as for predicting mortality but still pretty good. And then compared to validation, it did perform, uh, it actually performed pretty well compared to the uh, Mayo risk score. They also looked at infection and it did not perform quite as well. It did predict, um, it did perform better than the other models, but it's still not, the, the curve as you can see is flattening instead of approaching that corner. They published this and there's a website you can go to right here and you can just plug in these variables and it'll spit out your, it's plug in all those variables and it'll spit out a score. You select your, um, <clears throat> a type of surgery as well. You hit calculate and it'll give you 30, 90, 180 day um, mortality and also 90 day decompensation. So to kind of take home point from these models is that models are continuously need updating and validation as surgical and, and as anesthetic practices change. You guys are getting better at getting patients through the surgery and managing a lot of those, preventing a lot of those complications from occurring. And surgical technique is also improving and our general perioperative management is improving. And so outcomes are improving. And so usually utilizing data from two decades ago is not necessarily useful uh, predicting our current patients' uh, risks. And then also future scores should probably look into incorporating other variables such as frailty because that has a pretty profound impact on um, mortality. And then understand, and when you're using these, you just need to understand how the model was developed in order to determine is it truly applicable to your patients. In addition to risk assessment as part of our preoperative and perioperative planning, you're going to assess for frailty. You want to assess for volume status and cephalopathy and coagulopathy. We'll sometimes have patients sent to us and say, can you improve their cirrhosis? No, we can't improve their cirrhosis because it is what it is. There is uh, we can't make the fibrosis go away or necessarily the portal hypertension will um, improve. Just so you know, TIPS has been looked at um, and does not has not necessarily pre preoperative TIPS has not necessarily been shown to actually improve outcomes consistently. Some uh, sites have been positive, some sites have not. We can try to tune up these um, their volume status and make sure that their encephalopathy is well treated. But we're not going to. There's not much we can do to make their cirrhosis better, other than try to address the underlying cause. And that you know, and that may or not may or may not be feasible. Pretty much we can try to aid in tune, tuning them up. And then when they're sent to us, we're often asked for clearance. And we can't really provide clearance because scenario, each situation is different. And what might be an unacceptable risk for one patient might be an acceptable risk for another patient, depending on the situation. So we generally aid in um, providing a risk assessment, but the decide the decision to proceed has to be weighed by the um by the surgeon weighing and the patient weighing the benefits and the risks. And then obviously, if the plan decisions to proceed, then there's going to be anesthetic planning, as you guys are well aware of. And I'm probably not the guy to give the talk on agents and their risks and um, um, that can be used during a uh, during a there's with this, there was a, what um, a one, several authors have proposed a checklist for what to do um, preoperative liver assessment checklist for patients with liver disease. So you want to characterize their liver disease, identify their comorbid conditions, look at prior current or hepatic uh, decompensations, and then ultimately um, calculate risk and then review of medications, and then do informed consent. So now I might be going a little bit long in my apologies. Uh, uh, but my apologies, but um, so we're gonna so 
the clinical. Um, so let's get back to our clinical scenario. This is a 58 year old male with diabetes, mild obesity, nasterosis, complicated by dietic, diuretic controlled ascites and no history of encephalopathy or variceal bleeding, desiring a right TKA because his, his knee pain is limiting his mobility and quality of life. And like, and as I as we reviewed before, these are the labs. Should you proceed? So, well, what is his risk? If you use the Mayo risk calculator, his 30 day mortality would be predicted at 20 percent and 90, 90 day mortality at 30 percent. However, if you use the vocal pen risk calculator, his 30 day mortality is better at 9.5 percent and the 90 day mortality is 17.2 percent. Decompensation event is 13.5 percent. Risk is 13.5 percent. The risk is still quite high. But the decision whether or not to proceed may largely hinge on how desperate this patient is to have his knee fixed. And generally, we might try to counsel to see if you could avoid it because this is fairly high risk. Now, the question is whether or not we should do a transplant evaluation in the event they decompensate postoperatively. And sometimes we do this. If somebody's being considered for a major surgery, we'll, even if their MELD score is low, we'll evaluate them for liver transplantation to see if it would be an option should they decompensate postoperatively. Now, just keep in mind, it's not a guarantee that they're going to get a liver transplant if things don't go well because there's many things that can eliminate candidacy if they have bad wound and bad infections or postoperatively. We can't transplant them. If they become horribly deconditioned, malnourished, postoperatively, we may not be able to transplant them. You know, there's it's not a guarantee if we are to do that. And so still the decision will have to be made about the risk versus benefit. But if you have a potential safety net, the risk may be a little bit more tolerable to tolerable if you were to choose to proceed. What about another slightly different scenario? Um, same patient, but now this is an elective repair of a symptomatic umbilical hernia. First patient, we might say try to manage this as, as medically as much as possible. But in this patient, he's symptomatic umbilical hernia, frequent pain, having to lay down and reduce his hernia on his own frequently um, to get relief. Patients 30-day and 90-day mortality based on the Mayo risk score would be the same for an umbilical hernia repair. But with vocal pen, the risk, uh, if it's an elective procedure, is 4.8%. Um, and the 90 at uh, 30 day mortality and the 90 day mortality is 8.6% and with a decompensation rate of around 16%. That may be acceptable, especially when you concede, consider if you were not to proceed with it and then the patient actually develops an incarcerated hernia that now requires an emergent or urgent procedure. And then the 30 more day, day, day mortality has jumped to 90 up to, um, well, excuse me, the mayor risk score risks are still the same, but the 30 day mortality score, mortality based on the vocal pen score has now jumped up to 11.4%, the 90 more day mortality 17.7%. So, you know, sometimes, and one of the big criticisms of some of these models is that it's deterred some surgeries that may have been better to have been, been done when it was under an elective situation as opposed to waiting for emergent or urgent situation where the mortality is actually much higher. And so, again, there's no right or wrong answers on this, and you have to weigh all this with each individual's patient situation and their symptoms and what, what's the expected chance of success as to whether or not you proceed. And so, in conclusion, patients with liver disease being considered for an operation should be evaluated for having advanced fibrosis, and patients with cirrhosis are at higher high risk for decompensation and mortality postoperatively. Generally, if you have somebody with advanced liver disease, you should probably be you should probably consult hepatology to help assess risk and assist with management postoperatively. And then the decision is one that will um, to proceed is one that will be made by heavily weighing the risks and benefits. And the answer should not always be a blanket no. In some situations, the right answer is to proceed. And so with that, um, that is the um, end of my talk. I'll stop sharing my screen. All right, and uh, hopefully you, I did not put a bunch of people to sleep. <laughs> uh, that was that was terrific. I appreciate the case in particular and and how you thought through that. Um, I have a couple questions, but I'll wait uh, and see if anyone else wants to jump in and unmute first, and and if not, I'll fire away. Anybody have a particular question? One one question I do have, and I really appreciate the historical timeline there because. I feel like this happens in pre-op eval for cardiac disease as well, right? We have one model that the RCRI, which seems to really overestimate risk, and it's 30 years old, and then the the more recent ones that uh, maybe underestimate a little bit, but are much different. So that was that was super helpful um, to get that perspective. Vocal pen, 
when it talks about 90 day decompensation, once you're decompensated, are you always decompensated? We think of heart failure as sort of moving in and out of that. But with liver disease, you once you de develop decompensated disease, you're technically always decompensated. Now, obviously, there, there are some patients who had alcohol related liver disease, quit drinking, and they, you know, they're come off everything for treatment of ascites and encephalopathy and all of that. And their portal pressures, you can tell, have dropped over time. And maybe some of those patients actually may have more had more acute alcohol related hepatitis as opposed to purely cirrhosis and fibrosis. But um, generally, though, in general, though, when we say somebody's developed decompensated disease, once you're decompensated, you're always technically decompensated. You know, and so we'll monitor you. Uh, we're monitor everybody with stresses indefinitely. But kind of once you develop decompensation, we generally say you are. Um, but I, I had a case today, a, a, a patient today, where he wanted to be considered for um, a, uh, um, a hernia repair. You know, he was alcohol had alcohol related stresses. He's now come off all diuretics, and he's kind of technically almost compensated again. I mean, for most all sense of purposes, he's recompensated. And so I kind of felt that his score was probably going to be more likely an ASA three. And I use the ASA three in the model. Yeah. You kind of look at them clinically. I mean, if they're not requiring any treatment and they've been stable for a long time, then most likely, yeah, they're back to being a three. Uh, when you when you think about some of the things that you mentioned with cirrhosis and they they broke up did they break up the etiology viral you know cholestatic alcoholic from your perspective we need to be thinking that wow i need to be even more careful in the or with the blood pressure because the etiology matters that much or is it simply that that kind of fits some of the data like is there anything for it us fits some of the data because alcohol and cholestatic liver diseases tend to drive the bilirubin more and as you know the bilirubin is laid the least in the meld system, meld score right and so i think it's kind of another marker of that um and that's why i think alcohol got you know lumped together with cholestatic because um, often, especially with acute alcohol-related hepatitis, they have profound jaundice. Even though on biopsy, you look at alcohol and you look at NASH, which is the form of fatty liver disease that progresses versus, they look identical on biopsy. And so I always found that interesting, but yeah, it's probably more because of the bilirubin driving it, in my opinion. There had, but there is some difference in terms of how well they, uh, uh, how they do. And generally, yeah, the, Patients with cholestatic liver diseases tend to do better, even though they're decompensated, have tended to do a little bit better. But depending on the model and the Mayo uh, vocal pen did not find that that being significant, so they didn't actually include it in their model. It. And it's funny because the Mayo model, they threw that in there. And when you read that paper, you're like, all of a sudden at the end of the discussion, they published this web link and for the model and they threw in the etiology of liver disease. But when you're looking at all their data, they, unless it's in the brain and some of the supplemental tables, that never really made the pa paper as alcohol cholestatic versus uh, the, the other, uh, you know, yeah. other. And so I really found that interesting. And the model got put out there. And you didn't really see like a nice validation uh, study like what we showed with the, what I showed with the vocal pen. And so I really struggled finding examples of how it was validated. You know, that and so that was kind of intriguing. And that was funny because like everybody else, like, you know, you kind of read the paper and you don't and you start using it. It's like, OK, great. You know, this is better than what we had before. But it, in the end, you know, you, you do have to be somewhat critical of what you're of the tools that we're using. Hey, yeah, I had a, I had a quick question. Um, has anyone um, ever combined some of these patient specific factors like their lab values with more of a detailed understanding of the surgical procedure that they're going to undergo, like, for example, the primary CPT code and, you know, maybe using some of the more advanced uh, novel um, modeling methodologies to create a more patient specific um, prediction of, of risk. I think the closest you're going to get to that is what we is what that's been published as the vocal pen, because I think it's also numbers. You need to have numbers and to really know to really make a determination and and actually and then also a real mineable database to for those clinical variables to know whether or not you know what the I mean mortality is a little bit easier but if you're going to be looking at decompensation and other things you have to be able to mine the charts 
And so I think the numbers is the issue. And so it's even, yes, the vocal pen has six categories, which is, you know, which is great, but not all surgeries fall under that category, those categories. But I do think like, you know, you can kind of imagine that if it's an endovascular procedure with just percutaneous access or an endoscopy or something like that, the risk is going to be low. And we've all seen this. We do hundreds and hundreds of uh um, procedures on these on these patients where there's not general anesthesia and they do really quite well. And it is something about the, being under general anesthesia and the more prolonged that there seems to be a little bit of a link or has been reported, but you know that's never really quite made it into some of the models as well. And how is decompensation um, captured in our electronic health record? Do you have any? Well, you ideas? have to look for diagnoses of ascites, hepatic encephalopathy, variceal bleeding. Okay. And so, and so that's, so you can do it by ICD uh, codes um, or if, and if, if you have natural language processing, you can actually pull it that way as well. Thank you very much. So we're over time. I'd love one quick last question, then we can let everybody go. Um, one of the things I see, and, and I don't know, Matt, if you see this in the high rise clinic, but that it, I, I don't feel like it's captured in any of the um, scores yet is actually patients being evaluated for fairly significant spine surgery. And I don't know if vocal pin put that under major orthopedic, but it seems I, like there's some separate papers about spine in particular being potentially problematic. I thought that they were kind of lumped into major orthopedic, but I okay. do not know. I would have to go back and look and see if how spine, if spine was separate, but I thought those were kind of lumped into major orthopedic. Well, Andy, thank you so much. Um, pleasure, that was guys. terrific. Everybody, it's recorded. We'll put it up on our you know, YouTube channel for the department. And uh, yeah, that was just excellent and super, uh, really appreciate your time and taking the opportunity to, uh, to teach us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Appreciate it. Okay. All right, everybody. Take you have care, a great guys. day.